This is the situation of the refugees, worse this time than it has been before. Certainly, I mean, the first time the people at least got temporarily settled down, they built some huts in the area where I was working, but now, as you would see, the thing went back to how it was in 1949, back in tents, with the condition of the weather here, the dust, and the nature of the land, no water so far, and uh, the temperature can be around 40 today, 40 centigrade. East Jordan, 1967. For the third time, war in the Middle East has forced many Palestinian Arabs to become refugees. These new refugees are added to the million 300,000 whose plight has a history of nearly 20 years. The planes were flowing very low over our camps, and uh, the situation was horrifying because the people started running out of the camps as a few of the bombs fell here and there. And uh, we had to go out, I was planning to take my family to a safer place. So I just brought them down to Amman. Isaac Nashashibi is an area officer for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. He has been a refugee since 1948. How do you feel about all this yourself? Well, I don't think anybody would be pleased from the situation we are living in. How would, you leave, how would you feel yourself being a refugee twice in your life, in 20 years? Not good. That's how I'm feeling. Khalil Bouhesi, an Arab refugee in Gaza. How did your children feel when the, when the fighting was going on around here? Oh, they were very afraid. They were very afraid. And they were hiding between their families, weeping and shouting. Well, they were very afraid, you can't say. How did you feel about the fighting around here, Rafat? How did you feel about when all the noise of the bombs? He was afraid. He was hiding under the trees. Hiding in the, under the trees, and he, when he was uh, hearing the uh, palms and the guns, he was very afraid. Every one of us had been afraid. And he uh, was always asking me, Father, Father, stop this war, stop these palms, <laughs> as if I can stop this war. Uh, this, is the, this is his own feelings, but you can't imagine the feeling of a father when he finds his children afraid of war. 1947, November 19, the United Nations General Assembly resolves to partition Palestine into an Arab state and a Jewish state. 1948, May 14, the mandate of the United Kingdom in Palestine expires. A Jewish state is proclaimed under the name of Israel. The following day, the Arab states institute armed action in Palestine. One result of the conflict is that 700,000 Arabs become refugees. A few months after the 1948 war, 700,000 Arabs who had formerly lived in what had now become Israel were scattered throughout the Middle East. They were in the remaining parts of Palestine, the Gaza Strip, and the West Bank of the Jordan. They were also in the neighboring states of Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. At that time, the United Nations was just three years old, and the Middle East became one of the UN's earliest major areas of concern. It was there that the UN first learned the art of peacekeeping, first used soldiers to supervise an armistice. But the huge refugee population was a constant reminder that the war which had made them homeless had never reached the peace table. It could break out again. As the years went on, many ways of solving the problems of the Middle East were suggested at the United Nations. None was adopted. Meanwhile, the refugees went on living in exile. 
their families grew larger. Their condition remained precarious. To meet the first needs of the refugees, the United Nations in 1949 had created UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. UNRWA dealt with the basics, housing, food, health, education. At first, it built crude shelters for the refugees in dozens of camps and educated their children in modern school buildings. UNRWA helped find jobs for many. But grateful as the refugees were for the humanitarian efforts of UNRWA, they never regarded the agency as anything more than a stopgap. And on occasions when they felt that UNRWA's well-intentioned efforts were threatening to make their situation permanent, the refugees were sharply critical because their strongest desire was to return to their homeland. The Israelis attacked us on 1948. Hamdi Herzala, a Palestinian refugee in Gaza. And those who were able to leave their country, they left. It is not by our own wish, as we hear many times, that the Palestinians left their country by their own wish. Who, uh, uh, I, we want to use our minds. Who likes to leave his house, his properties, his land, and to become as a refugee living on charity? To say, please, other people, give me ration. This is unlogic. Well, let me, let, me, let me pose a very difficult situation. That's just for the sake of an argument. Suppose, suppose it is impossible to go back to Palestine. Yes. Ever. What then? But uh, I think our, our, our life here is, is, is built on, on hope of returning. And I think you can't find any refugee, any Palestinian, can argue you if you say to him, suppose that you will not return. This is something else. He can't uh, share you the argument at all. Believe me, if anybody knows or he will be well informed about the problem, we believe he will not support the Palestinian Arab refugees, he will support the justice. And we used all, uh, always to say that right over might. And this is what we are asking for. But now, uh, uh, as an example, Gaza Strip is a limited area. 45 kilometers length with 5 to 8 kilometers width. In this small area lives about 450,000 people. The density here is higher than the Netherlands. Then we are increasing and living in the same limited area. What will happen in the future? Somebody says that you can go to the uh, other Arab countries. But if anybody goes back to the report of Mr. Davis, Dr. Davis, he was the ex-Commissioner uh, General of UNRWA, he says even this is not a practical solution because the Arab countries, they still have the non-employed people. It means that they cannot economically absorb the Palestinian refugees. A fifth of the refugees from the 1948 conflict re-established themselves in the Arab world. They have never been a charge on UNRWA. The others were mostly poorer people of farming stock, and it was their misfortune that the countries where they found refuge already had a surplus of peasant farmers. Those countries were facing grave problems in providing livelihood for their own citizens. Even so, many of these poorer refugees found homes for themselves in towns and villages, and the number of refugees living in the UNRWA camps never exceeded 40% of the total refugee population. But for them, the temporary camps became permanent homes. There was nowhere else to go. The best they could hope for was gradual improvement of living conditions. And that, in fact, happened, sometimes to a marked degree, and particularly in areas where there were opportunities for employment. Consequently, some of the camps developed into thriving communities, even though still at a fairly low economic level. 
UNRWA's area officer in Jerusalem is Tony Bakajan. First of course, uh, as they started living in tents, they had nothing. When their economic situation improved, and when we were in the business of building shelters for them, they started buying bedsteads, mattresses, timuses, rather than cook on, you know, wood. They started buying some chairs, perhaps a cupboard for the family, perhaps a radio. And throughout the years, uh, we really took great pride in the struggle for survival that these refugees put in trying to supplement what they got from us uh, through their earnings, no matter how modest they were, so that they could feed their families. And the fact that we never had any epidemic or any deterioration in health standards, we always thought was the best proof that they were really putting up a heroic fight for survival. And over and above that, there was marked improvement in their houses. So the refugees were not rotting in idleness. There was some progress in their lives due chiefly to three factors. First, the accelerated economic development of the Arab countries in which the refugees lived. Second, the energy, intelligence, and adaptability of the refugees themselves, who showed themselves eager for work and capable of seizing any opportunity given to them. And third, the education and training which host governments, voluntary agencies, and UNRWA were able to provide for the young refugees, which enabled them to take advantage of better employment opportunities. Now, if any refugee is not educated, it will be very hard for him to find a job because he is living in an educated community. Uh, in addition, the educated people can reach or gain or regain their rights better than the uneducated ones. UNRWA established vocational training centers where thousands of young refugees learned trades and skills. The jobs for which they were trained are in great demand throughout the Arab world. What, what, what is the name of the course? Uh, this is the Wilder, Wilder course. What, what, uh, what's the name of the course? What's the name of this course? Telecommunication. Uh, what kind of a job will you get when you get out of this course? What? What kind of job? What kind of work you do when you get out of here? What kind of work you do when you get out of here? What kind of work you do when you get out of Plumber, plumber. A plumber? Yes. Make uh, kitchen sinks, bathrooms? Yes, yes. yes. And my work is uh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> that women can't work here. And many, 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 many uh, women are working. Really? I thought that women really didn't get a chance to work here at all. Why? Many. Many do. Who told you? Huh? Who told you that? Well, you get this impression all the time that, that in this part of the world, people don't get a chance, uh, women don't get a chance to work. You have a wrong idea about she, she has the right as a man. What's that? She has the right as a man to work. Is that really true? Yes. Why not? I want to become a man and make a money and build a house. It's like it is. You think you'll get a good job? Yes. Because he, I am as a poor and I like this work. Yes. And my brain is uh, this work. Mine. <laughs> you think you're good at that? What? You're good at that. Mabsut. Mabsut. Yes. Very good. Yes, my heart is very good. <laughs> 1967, June the 5th, war breaks out again between Israel and the Arab states. On the 5th, it was Monday. We stayed the whole night, of course, hearing the, the radio. And the next day, my brother, my mother, and me left from Jericho to Amman in the afternoon. 
and we don't know what will happen. Time has not been a healing force in the Middle East. It is not likely to be one in the future. By June of 1967, the refugee population had grown to a million three hundred thousand. During and immediately after the June war, another two hundred thousand Arabs became refugees. There are now twice as many refugees as there were in 1948. The thing went back to how it was in 1949, back in tents, and uh, no water so far. What's going to happen to these people here? Can they find jobs? I don't see any jobs so far. <laughs> Unless something unexpected develops in the meantime, but I don't see any jobs. They are relying totally on us. I am only giving them fresh meals. If you find any resistance on the part of the people, I should think they'd be very frustrated at this point. They are frustrated, you see, and I think these people have lost confidence in everybody in this world. They were having and building big hopes on returning back to their homes, and now they find themselves again in the wilderness, living under tents, and the, under the worst circumstances a human being can ever live. We are losing confidence in anything in the world now, even the conscience of the world, because they believe, as they have put it to me, I say again, that in this world there is no justice, but there are interests only. And where interest goes, justice disappears. In this world there is no justice, but there are interests only. And where interest goes, justice disappears. You know, I hope that uh, after I was graduated, of course my, my father died 20 years ago, and we were very small. We were all children, four children with our mother, and my mother wasn't working. Then we grew up and uh, we began to work until we could uh, make our house uh, completely with its furniture and to live like the other people, not uh, in the high society, but uh, like other people. And now at once all of it together, nothing at all, under the sun, under the sky. The 
first time from Ramli near Lidda to Jericho, of course before to Medaba, then to Salt, then, then to Ramallah, and we stayed in Jericho until now. And now from Jericho to Amman, and we don't know what will happen. That's it, that's it. This is the tent. And that's everything. We are planning to give them some blankets. During the 20 years, they have suffered, in addition to the miserable and bad life, they have suffered from three wars, 1948, 1956, 1967. And they have lost their properties, they have lost their sons, they have lost their supports, some of their families. I can give an example of myself, for instance. In 1947, I have lost all my properties in, in, in my village. In 1948, my home, in, uh, when I was a refugee in Deir el Balah village here, the plans bombed my home. My mother, my brothers were killed. We were a family with 25 persons. Twelve of them were killed in 1948. In this village, in Deir el Balah. And in 1956, we have suffered. We lost some of our properties. And now we are suffering from losing some of our men, for our supports. How can, I think it is the same feeling, my tribe. They are feeling very sad and very miserable. Because any nation in the world, if you put him under these circumstances, will feel the same. No improvement in their situation. Refugees suffering, suffering from poverty, suffering from need to everything, to every kind of, of help, suffering from war three times within 20 years. And this is the situation, in very simple words. confidence in everybody in this world. I like to return to my country in South Asia. If this is the this is the best thing I, I, I hope from my God to to to, to happen. If I can see my my village, if I can return to to live there as as a as a human being, this is my my only wish. If we don't find a solution in due course, and if the world will not be cooperative with us and help us, may will we leave with all the world to a to a damageful war because wise people in due course will not be heard if there is pressure and pressure and pressure you think that wise men are still listened to now 
for a limited for a, for a limited uh, distance but but the time is coming where the wise men will be will not be heard at all and mad men will work and then can't know what no one can can imagine what will happen this is a very dangerous uh, part of the world the middle east and everyone must take care of it because any kind of war may be widened and may be stretched and may lead to a very damageful war secretary general uthant in my view the failure of the united nations over these years to come to grips with the deep-seated and angrily festering problems in the middle east has to be considered as a major contributing factor to the war of last June. Although naturally, primary responsibility inescapably rests with the parties involved. I am bound to express my fear that if again no effort is exerted and no progress is made towards removing the root causes of conflict within a few years at the most, there will be ineluctably a new eruption of war. by the U.S. Broadcasters Committee for the United Nations.